Welcome everybody to uh, our webinar this evening, uh, Power Over Scoliosis on Vertebral Body Tethering. Uh, next slide. We've got, uh, I'm Peter Newton. I'm uh, a spine surgeon uh, in San Diego at Rady Children's Hospital. And I'm uh, joined in, my moder in the moderating duties by uh, Stephen George, a spine surgeon uh, at uh, Nichols Children's Hospital in Miami, Florida. Uh, and uh, we'll take you through uh, tonight's uh, speaker panel. Next. We have uh, four really spectacular uh, physicians to uh, present to you tonight. Uh, Amr Samdani from uh, Philadelphia, Feroz Mianji from Vancouver, British Columbia, Baron Lawner from New York City, and uh, Derek Lee from Ontario, Canada. Next. In addition, we've got to two patients uh, and one mother. Uh, who will uh, share their stories uh, and their uh, challenges with scoliosis. Uh, Sydney with uh, a vertebral body tether and Sophie after her posterior spinal fusion. Next. Remember uh, the, the instructions here. This is, there is a Zoom Q&A uh, on the bottom uh, panel there. And please uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, your questions will come up and our moderators will monitor that Q&A box uh, and present them to the speakers. You can enter those at any time along the way. Uh, you don't need to wait for that uh, uh, talk to be finished. Next. Here's our agenda tonight. Again, we've got uh, two lectures, uh, then a patient story, then uh, two more. Um, and uh, another story, so we'll, uh, and have some uh, concluding remarks. Next. Great, I just want to let you know that this uh, event is sponsored by Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. This is a, a nonprofit with uh, the mission and vision, as you can uh, read here. We are uh, really interested in creating a future where children with scoliosis have the ability to live happy, healthy, and productive lives. Next. Great, well, our uh, first speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Derek Lee, uh, and he's got a, a really interesting perspective uh, to bring to us about uh, this topic of vertebral body tethering and a huge amount of uh, experience that he's gained in uh, talking with uh, so many of the, the folks that are uh, in this field. Uh, Derek's really become one of uh, the leading uh, knowledge sources for uh, vertebral body tethering. So Derek, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Newton. Um, super uh, happy to be uh, part of this esteemed group today. All right. So today I'm gonna basically talk about bridging the scoliosis information gap for patients and their families, but from a patient perspective. I thought the best way to illustrate uh, how to basically uh, get up to speed on scoliosis and all the treatment options is to uh, share my son's journey. At 14 years old, if we start on the left part of the screen, he was diagnosed with a 34 degree curve by accident. It was basically from an x-ray for a, a, a chronic cough he had. And it was just by accident that we picked it up at that point. And with most parents like myself, it's immediate shock and then guilt that we didn't find it sooner. And that's a very common attribute. Uh, from that point on, I handed it off to um, um, the surgeons in terms of, or the medical profession in terms of them trying to take control of the situation. And from there, we had to wait in, in Ontario for about two months and then two months more for the brace. So the curve went from 30, 40 degrees to 53 degrees at that particular time. Sorry, a little bit emotional about this. Um, but what happened is that at a 53 degree curve, it's already at a surgical level. And as a parent, we all want to avoid surgery if possible. So my next uh, project was basically to see if I could avoid surgery and go towards conservative treatments. So I searched Google, lots of misinformation and contradiction. Um, and often it's 
it's a Google is a selling platform as well. So there's lots of scams and almost too good to be true stories. And if it's too good to be true, it's probably wrong. Looked at PubMed for research and just too much information overload. Didn't know where to start. Then I dropped into some Facebook groups and this was where I actually found some really good information. We Parents will, will share basically firsthand accounts of um, a non-surgical and surgical treatments to EIS. And at this time we tried a second attempt at bracing um, and Schroth with uh, scoliosis specific exercises and a little bit of chiropractic treatment. At that point, we were able to reduce his curve from 53 degrees to 42 degrees, which is amazing. But I knew in four months, but I knew that as he was going to go, get into his growth spurt, that it was just going to uh, progress. It just, I knew it. So at that point, he had to face reality and consider surgery. So the next step was I needed to find better information, more, more current information. So I dropped back into the uh, Facebook groups, identified BBT as an option, identified surgeons, uh, cross-referenced with PubMed, and I set up five consultations with BBT surgeons to looking for a consensus. And we found out that four of the five agreed that uh, Jacob is basically a candidate for BBT. Now it took about 15 months from the initial diagnosis uh, to surgery at, surgery at um, Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia with um, Dr. Amir Sandani, who's amazing, by the way. That hospital's incredible. Um, and uh, three years later, almost, his curve has re reduced to about 20 degrees with a 60% correction rate. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about those five scoliosis surgeon consultations. From there, from there, I just wanted to share that information because uh, talking to the surgeons and therapists, so much information, you get to see out the personality of the surgeon, how they think, or their decision-making skills. And right now, there are over 50 interviews. You can check out the, uh, the YouTube videos here. I also want to touch on Facebook scoliosis groups. Now, they're incredibly supportive, almost all of them. And one of the ones I wanted to touch on is scoliosis support for teens, tweens, and parents of these. Check that out when you can, super supportive. But oftentimes the Facebook groups show a little bit of misinformation and biases. And I wanted to see if I can evolve that to a different level and add research, interviews, medical expertise. So I started this Facebook group about five months ago and it's trying to connect patients, parents, and families with scoliosis with surgeons, orthodox, and physiotherapists. And it's expanded to about a thousand members. And I think that's the next step in terms of bridging the scoliosis information gap. This final slide shows uh, basically tips on looking back on what I know now. Uh, check it out when you can. This uh, talk is going a little bit over, over uh, time, but I just wanna say that you have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Thanks so much. Great, thanks, Derek. Uh, Stephen, we'll turn over the uh, question answer to you. Thank you, Derek. That was that was a great talk, and it's uh, also fascinating to watch someone in healthcare actually navigate the system. I think sometimes you know it should be easy, and then and then. Uh, you know, you're sort of a testament to the fact that it can be challenging, but thank you for putting that together. Uh, once again, if anyone has questions, they can put they can put it in the chat as we speak. But can you talk a little bit about um, your feeling as a parent, uh, sort of backing into the diagnosis of your child having scoliosis? Oh, of course. And don't forget, I'm a chiropractor as well. So when so first of all parents feel so guilty that they they drop the ball and they blame themselves so much uh, so it's the shock of the diagnosis the guilt and the issue is is that you have to really rebound from that quickly and start advocating for your for your child and the best way to do that is to become educated uh to try to go to trusted sources like uh setting scoliosis straight for instance and the more you can increase your knowledge base, when you start talking to other therapists, orthotists, physiotherapists, and surgeons, you basically can elevate the conversation from basic to more advanced. And then 
you can do, you can basically decide with shared decision making um, shared de uh, decision making um, targets for sure. Thank you so much. Um, in the essence of time, we're going to get uh, moving to the next talk here. Thank you so much, Derek, for for that. Uh, <clears throat> our next speaker um is dr Lawner, who comes to us from new york he's at mount sinai he's the chief of uh, minimally invasive scoliosis surgery uh he's going to be talking to us about the latest in tethering research he's been uh, intimately involved uh in and a part of uh, a lot of this research so he's a great person to be giving this talk so uh with no further ado uh dr Lawner. thanks so much Stephen. it's great to be with you all uh, um i have a lot to cover so i'll speak a little bit uh, at a rapid clip um Obviously, the, for many of you know that the standard operation for patients with severe adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is a spinal fusion. And these are patients who have a healthy spine, but a curved spine. And I think largely the impact of the fusion is based on how low we go in the spine. Um, so we uh, performed a study, our group did, uh, in which we looked at patients 10, 10 years following surgery. So these are patients in their 20s. And if the fusion extended down to L4, there are five lumbar vertebra. And if you fuse to L4, uh, one in four patients had significant disc degeneration or wear and tear in their lower backs below the fusion. And if you fuse to L3, about one in 10 patients. So there's an impact of how low we go. Uh, let me take it back. So for this reason, there's, I think, a significant benefit to uh, uh, offering the tether for patients with lumbar as to avoid fusion into the lower lumbar spine, perhaps. And time will tell, and study is important to know how patients do and what their outcomes are in comparison to fusion. This is kind of a collage of the types of patients and families those who tend to be athletic and uh, involved in uh, dance and sports that require a lot of flexibility tend to migrate to this, but others do as well. We performed a, a collaborative study with the FDA and Noel Larson recently uh, presented this at the Scoliosis Research Society. Essentially, we sent out questionnaires to about 350 families and found that the two most important goals of surgery for these families and patients are to one, have an improvement in their body shape and their appearance of their back. And the other very important attribute was uh, maintaining flexibility and motion of the spine. So we go at this shared decision-making approach where we try to inform families of the information, the data we have, the information we don't know outcomes and discuss the various options. Uh, the procedure is really based on growth modulation, and Dr. Samdani will speak about that, but essentially growth uh, allows the spine to correct gradually over time, and a, a wedged vertebra then becomes square over time, and I'll leave that to Dr. Samdani to discuss. But this is the ideal patient, this patient really on the higher end of curvature, but she had a flexible curve, and we applied the tether, and then over time she corrected further from the initial uh, uh, correction that we achieved in the operating room. And this is what her back looks like at uh, uh, the follow-up. Dr. Samdani and Dr. Betts uh, reported the first series of patients, of 11 patients with your follow-up, showing this improved correction over time of growth. And then Dr. Newton did the same. His study uh, uh, looked at patients after years after surgery and also showed improvement, but then a slight loss of time, perhaps because of some breakage of the tether. And Dr. Newton forged the way uh, early on, and, and some of the patients represent the learning curve of both when to ideally intervene and offer this procedure, and when maybe it's best not to. So he had uh, reported a reoperation rate is, uh, of 40%, which is quite high, and a clinical success rate of only 59%, that, that clinical success defined as curvatures less than 35 degrees. So we learned a lot from Dr. Newton's data. Uh, his patients tended to be younger. They had open triradiate cartilage, the, the growth plate at the hip. So these patients had a lot of growth. And so some of them didn't correct well and curves got out of hand. And as in this patient went on to spinal fusion. Now, Dr. Hornschmeyer in a similar study, this is out to five years in some patients, two to five years, 27 patients. 
but his patients were different. Most of them had closed triradiate cartilage, that, that hip growth plate. So they're more mature, had less growth remaining. And so his success rate now goes from 59% to 74%. And he also had revisions, uh, reoperations, but now it's cut in half. And I think it's related to the amount of growth remaining. Now, our group uh, with Peter taking the lead, Dr. Newton, uh, compared 237 tether patients to the standard, the gold standard, which is spinal fusion. And we find that the curve at the end at follow-up of two years is slightly greater for the tether patients, but more patients are achieving success. Three out of four patients in the tether, almost all the fusion patients had curves less than 35 degrees. And you can also see the reoperation rate 16% for tether, but only 1% went on to spinal fusion in this group, uh, a very low reoperation rate for the fusion patients. Dr. Mianji and our group, we performed a similar study for lumbar curves. These are lanky five curves, they're lumbar curves. We found uh, four times less blood loss for the tether patients versus fusion, um, very high rates of, of, of clinical success, meaning curves less than 35 degrees and similar between both groups, similar curve correction, similar improvement of the, the bump on the back, the scoliometer measure. And then only two patients of the 19 went on to spinal fusion uh, in the tether. So we're improving, we're learning, and we're getting better. This is a patient of mine out to three years where we have uh, maintaining uh, flexibility of the spine without fusion. Uh, we also have studied uh, major complication rates in 328 patients in our, our again in our group, 22% out to two years with some reoperations. Some patients, 8% went on to fusion. Some had their tether cut or removed or replaced. There was one patient with a, an incision that was infected, but it was treated. Uh, there were three patients at one hospital in the group that had a spinal fluid leak. I haven't heard of this uh, thereafter. And a uh, small percent, two out of 100, had respiratory problems. 23%, uh, so one in four patients had broken tethers, but only a small number required reoperation for this. On the other hand, overcorrection occurred in 8% of the patients, and a majority of these were reoperated, but only 1% of the total group required a spinal fusion. So we're getting better over time. Here's a patient of mine with some overcorrection, but had a very good clinical result and no need for surgery. But here's another patient. This patient was young. She had a lot of growth remaining, a big curve here, but she had a curve above and uh, the family really didn't want to avoid fusion. We talked about fusing the proximal or the upper curve at the time of tether, but they really wanted to hold off if possible. COVID hit and the curve got out of hand uh, with, with poor follow-up because of COVID. And then we ended up salvaging this by doing a fusion of the thoracic spine, but really leaving the lumbar spine alone in terms of fusion and maintaining flexibility. Now we've looked at uh, tether breakage in my own patients, 69 patients out to two years. And again, roughly one in four patients at two years had a breakage. The majority had only one level that had a break and in 20%, uh, there were two levels broken. And in this patient group, there was a mixed a group of thoracic and lumbar tethers. So the majority of the breakages occurred in the lumbar spine where there's more flexibility and load and stress on the tether. Um, but tether breakage doesn't e equal a failed result. This is a patient I operated on uh, at that time, five and a half years earlier, and he broke at every single level in the lumbar spine, but he really had an excellent outcome uh, now in his 20s uh, and doing very well. Uh, but in this patient, it didn't work out as well. She had two curves, and maybe in retrospect, we should have treated both curves, but we only tethered the lumbar. And nowadays, we're using two tethers or two cords in the lumbar spine to give it greater longevity. At least that's our hope. And this patient had a break, and then the curve above, the thoracic curve, increased. So we salvaged it by offering her spinal fusion and then doubled up the tether in the lumbar spine. She's now about uh, almost two years out and, and has done very well. So we know that the amount of growth remaining, so Sanders is the growth classification that we use. Uh, Sanders 2 has patients have more growth than a Sanders 6 or 7. And this study by Dr. Allen A and his team in Turkey uh, showed that there were greater mechanical complications for these much younger uh, patients with more growth. 
and much more overcorrection, 80% for these. So we delay a little bit longer and we're gonna diminish some of these problems that Dr. Newton reported on in his, his study as well. And then, you know, sometimes overcorrection occurs, um, but uh, the, then we can see a tether break and, and the patient falls in the sweet spot without needing a reoperation. This is a patient of mine who's a, a high level butterfly swimmer and did very well following her operation. Um, so what about double curves? We see a lot of these patients and the standard has been to fuse both, uh, both curves as, as in my patient here. But we also have studied in our, in our uh, research group uh, with the Setting Scoliosis Strait Foundation the, the treatment of these double curves with tether of both curves. And so for patients who had a larger thoracic curve, we got a better uh, correction with fusion compared to tether, but still reasonable corrections in the tether patients. And for patients with the larger curve being a lumbar curve, uh, the corrections of that major curve were equivalent. And these are just the comparisons. I think the long-term outcomes are gonna really be comparison of tether versus fusion 10, 20, 30 years down the line and how these patients do over the long run. So I just leave you with that. I think understanding the data, learning from our previous experience, uh, working with the families and, and in a sense, the patients who have come before are pioneers along with the surgeons and the scientists who have studied this. I think we're learning and refining our techniques and our indications uh, by following the data. Thank you. Thanks, Baron. Uh, I, we we uh, managed to get through our Q&A time with your talk, but uh, we're going to keep on uh, moving. If you want to ask questions, please continue to add those. I think we'll move directly into Dr. Mianji's talk. Uh, uh, so, Feroz, please uh, uh, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Uh, and good evening to everybody in North America and those of us that are not there. Um, good morning. Um, so I've been tasked about looking at some factors for decision making when you're considering, say, a fusion versus a BBT surgery. Um, and what I do is probably just dial back a little bit in terms of the principles of scoliosis surgery. So when we're trying to operate on patients with scoliosis, our primary goal is to prevent the progression of the curve, um, generally through a single surgical event, ideally. Um, and of course we have our secondary goals is trying to get the spine as straight as we can. We wanna improve the rib hump, the waist and shoulder asymmetry and try and really restore the natural curves of the spine, both when you're looking at uh, the spine from front to back as well as from the side. Um, fusion, as you heard, remains the gold standard. This is when we put anchors around each vertebrae and use two rods on either side of the spinal column to help move the spine in that uh, straighter position and fold it there. Um, when we're looking at a fusion surgery, there's really no upper limit for the size of the curve. Um, generally, any curves over 50 degrees is when we discuss surgery with patients. And the reason is the um, risk of progression of curves over 50, especially into adulthood. Now, when you look at fusion surgery, the cosmetic results, so what you're going to obtain in terms of correction is um, predictable because we're doing everything right there in the open are at time zero. And so what you obtain is, is very immediate. And as Dr. Lawner said, it does have a track record. It's considered gold standard because this is all we've been doing for the past several decades. Now, it is also considered invasive. And why is that? Well, when you're looking at uh, um, what we need to do to manipulate the spine, we instrument the spine and the joints that are connecting each of the vertebrae, they also need to be um, cut uh, so that we can manipulate again the spinal column and put it in a straighter position. And then we have to put all this extensive bone graft down so the spine in the area of where we need to fuse will no longer move again. Uh, and again, the correction is immediate as you can see from these x-rays as well as the clinical pictures. Um, and what about the chance of you requiring further surgery after fusion? So it is considered fairly low, anywhere from 5 to 13%. Uh, so again, it's a one and done deal with predictable results. When can you get back to activity? So generally at our center, we'd say you can get back to high level contact sports at about six months minimum. Some centers may push that to nine months to a year. But the, but the fact is that you can return to what you were doing uh, prior to your, your fusion surgery. This is a patient of mine. She was one of the uh, models for the original uh, Google Pixel phone following her fusion. Um, you know, she's wonderful and always sends me some emails of what she's doing. And this was about 10 years following her surgery 
um, saying that, you know, even after a fusion, life got back to normal and she became a firefighter with, uh, with the interior of British Columbia. But, you know, we all know this and, and we, we uh, understand this, that although we can correct deformity with diffusion, it is at the expense of motion. And we've been looking at motion studies where we get patients to um, bend forward as well as backward side to side to, to look at motion between the vertebrae. And Michelle Marx has really trailblazed um, this concept of looking at motion following fusion. And now more importantly, after, after um, uh, VBT. And of course, uh, all of our patients have told us, and we all believe this as surgeons and other caregivers, that motion is important in particular around the spine. And so um, other studies, as uh, Dr. Lawner has looked at, really have shown that even with the fusion, especially when you're going into lumbar spine, they may have some implications uh, in the long term. And so that really led the impetus for VBT. And the, the images on the uh, left hand there are actually some animal studies that Dr. Newton um, really, uh, uh, again, trailblazed uh, probably about two decades ago now in terms of basic science model, what a tether can do in, in creating a spine as well as correcting it. And so uh, a VBT model, the first published clinical case or proof of concept was now over 10 years ago. And many studies uh, subsequently have uh, come about and Dr. Lawner nicely showed this, but a lot of unknowns around uh, VBT really remain. And when we look at VBT compared to fusion, it is considered less invasive because the thoracic uh, uh, curves were able to, um, you know, we're able to treat these through a camera and, and small incisions uh, around the chest. And we place this tether and the screws are placed from, uh, from side to side. So they go from one side of the vertebrae across to the other side, as opposed to front and back with a fusion. But the correction is gradual. So if you have growth over time is when you're going to see the correction, not at, uh, not immediately following the surgery. And return to fill activities is, uh, is a lot sooner. Um, you know, generally at our center, anywhere from six to eight weeks, some, uh, some centers may push it to three months, but it is a lot sooner than, uh, than a fusion surgery. Um, now, as we uh, discussed maybe a little earlier with Dr. Lawner, the chance of requiring for the surgery, unfortunately, remains uh, uh, high. Um, it is significantly higher than fusion. Earlier studies, as the Dr. Lawner said, uh, they were fairly high, anywhere from 26 to 47 percent. And the real concerns around uh, why you need a, a repeat surgery following uh, following a VBT really is around overcorrection. So the tether could be too powerful, or you, you can get tether failure, unfortunately, progression of the, of the uh, deformity. And the way we see that is we'll say uh, a distance between the two lips of the screw heads uh, increase from one x-ray to the next. So the challenge uh, certainly with the VBT really still remains that who's the ideal patient for this technology and what's the ideal time and how big or small uh, can a curve be to be able to treat it with a, with a, a VBT? And how young or old uh, does a patient uh, need to be to have a successful VBT treatment? Um, and as you heard, really large data is essential for trying to show this kind of clinical uh, impact or translational work um, in our clinical trials um, so that we can offer some advancements uh, if, they prove to be, um, uh, if they prove to be good. Uh, we all know this uh, in our general lives, uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, uh, none of these actually have hard uh, um, inventory, but they've all really built uh, conglomerates on, on data. Uh, and having said this, uh, you know, the Seven Scoliosis Street Foundation and Harm Study Group have really pioneered uh, these concepts of patient registry, especially in the world of spinal deformity, uh, where we collect anonymous patient data from multiple sources so that we can use this data to answer difficult questions. Uh, and in the world of VBT, really uh, kudos to uh, to the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation because two studies have been launched. One's a retrospective, so patients that were treated in the past before 2019, and after the FDA approval since 2019, patients that are uh, been treated with VBT can certainly enter these databases and we can collect data and learn uh, more and more around uh, VBT and in the space of non-fusion technologies. And as Baron uh, alluded to, uh, this has actually showed us uh, some, some different numbers that we initially saw with, in particular with VBT, we we're noting that the complications are dropping. They're about 22% in a, in a large cohort. And these, co these patients came from multiple centers as opposed to from one single center. Uh, the complication rates also aren't benign for fusions. Uh, we've now learned that they're up to 7% within 10 years. And so again, it's really trying to identify factors so that we can look at complications and see how we can mitigate uh, or avoid them. Uh, and so I'd say around decision making for VBT, you want to expect more discussion around timing, curve size, skeletal maturity, i.e. are you a real candidate? And do you have an appetite for more surgery potentially? Whereas around a fusion, the discussion with your caregivers may be more concrete. 
uh, you'll have a predictable cosmetic result and the risk for reoperation will, will be fairly low. Uh, and so in summary, again, for fusion, if you're looking for a cosmetic result in a single surgical event, probably that's the way you want to steer. And for non-fusion or VBT, motion preservation and an earlier return to activity uh, will be more important for you. And in my practice over, um, I'd say the last 10 years, uh, you know, I think VBT does hold a space. It's, it's up to about 25 to 30%, but uh, still, uh, you know, we, we still do lots of fusion uh, procedures as well. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk, uh, Dr. Mianji. Um, some really good information in there. Um, in the essence of time here, um, have everybody put their questions again in that question box, and we'll uh, try to answer it there or present it to the uh, the panel. But at this time, we're going to actually introduce our first patient speaker who uh, is joining us, and her name is uh, Sophie Allison. She's joined with her mother, Karen, and they come to us from Southern California, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her story. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Sophie Allison and I am a uh, spinal fusion patient and this is a little bit about my experience. So I was diagnosed in sorry, 2020, I was diagnosed with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, when I was 15, I had a 54 degree curvature and this right here is what my spine looked like. Some of my initial reactions to being diagnosed is that I was most of all terrified of surgery and being put under anesthesia. I was unsure how my ability to redo hobbies that I like to do would uh, change. I was also overwhelmed with new information and tests that were being done, but the doctors were very reassuring. And over time, I was uh, able to feel less anxious about it. My family and friends were also very supportive. Uh, and then after the diagnosis, they wanted me to undergo some genetic testing. So I underwent testing for Marfan syndrome, uh, which is a connective tissue disorder um, in which the People that have it are usually tall and skinny and have long arms, which I did, but I actually did not end up testing positive for that syndrome. And then this image right here is my um, pre-operation flexibility. I was very flexible. I was able to put my foot behind my head and all of that. So I also underwent some lung capacity testing, which is pictured on the right. And then um, they actually found that I had a Chiari malformation, which is this, um, these two x-rays right here which essentially means that there is a blockage of spinal fluid in the spinal cord. So they had to have two corrective surgeries for that. They were a year apart. Uh, so as you can see here, this is my spinal fluid. And then this is what it looked like after the surgery. So after that was corrected, I was able to have my um, spinal fusion, which happened in July of 2020, which was at the um, Brady's Children's Hospital, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Peter Newton was my surgeon. I was very comfortable on the actual day of the surgery. I felt super put at ease by the staff and Dr. Newton, so it was a pretty comfortable experience for me. If uh, I could interject real quick, Sophie. Yeah, um, I wanted to say with her diagnosis happening in the spring of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were really grateful that all this testing was even done as swiftly as it was, because that was a time when all these elective surgeries and routine testing was um, postponed or canceled. So we really felt fortunate that we were moved along pretty uh, swiftly, greatly with the help of Radies who referred and helped us make a lot of these appointments, the MRI, those people called us, we didn't have to call them. And uh, we just felt really lucky to be living in um, Dr. Newton's backyard in North County, San Diego. Yeah, of course. And then this is my post-operation x-rays. As you can see, it's a pretty dramatic change from 54 degrees to being perfectly straight. Uh, my, my fusion was completely full. So from cervical to lumbar, I'm completely fused. Um, some things that I noticed post-op was that my scar was actually noticed by other patients. Um, I was approached in public by a few people that were like, oh, I see you have a, a scar. Did you have a spinal fusion? And so that was um, interesting. I didn't think that that would happen, but Another thing that I noticed is that my back had a lot of numbness from where the incision was, but over time it started to fade away, but I still have some numbness that resides um, mostly in between my shoulder blades. But other than that, I've experienced no pain. I've had no complications. Um, and yeah. So after my fusion, I mostly stuck with easygoing hobbies to start with, mainly playing ukulele, drawing, reading, 
things like that that weren't as physically taxing on me. And then after a year of recovery, I was able to do whatever I wished within reason. <laughs> um, and another thing is that um, I had to let my dentist know that I had to take a specific kind of antibiotics to avoid uh, infection in my spine. Uh, and my metal is non-reactive, so I don't set off metal detectors in airports or anything like that. Uh, I was able to go hiking Yosemite National Park. So that was a really cool experience that I didn't know if I would be able to do before my surgery, but it was really cool that I was still able to do that. I was able to graduate high school. I worked part-time as a waitress. I had no issues carrying, bending, twisting, things like that. And yeah, I've had no pain or discomfort since then. So uh, yeah, I was able to go to prom, took pictures with Dr. Newton for a magazine column, which was really cool. And I'm now studying nursing at Palomar College. So that is my experience. That is uh, fabulous. Sophie, thanks for uh, sharing your story. And uh, I think it's important for everybody, uh, for all of our patients to, to understand that um, you know, a spinal fusion can be done and when it's the right, uh, right choice uh, because you know, the other options don't exist and uh, you can go live a happy, productive life. And uh, we're happy to have you joining the medical profession uh, at some point. And uh, it's great, great to hear your story. Um, I think we, let me see, we had one question in here. Uh, how does VBT impact sagittal profiles? Um, Feroz, uh, maybe I can uh, throw that to you. Uh, sure, Peter. Um, uh, that's a great question. So generally, uh, when we do spinal surgeries from the front, we're worried that we're going to increase kyphosis. So that's a bit more of a, a C shape to your thoracic spine. But we haven't seen that. Um, we've actually seen from from the research that that sagittal profile is is reasonably maintained. Um, now, having said that, uh, you know, maybe a, a bit more uh, deep discussion. If the spine is extremely lordotic in the sagittal plane, then relying on DBT to correct that will, will maybe be pushing the envelope. So I would say that there's not been a, a big change in the sagittal profile. Um, and right now it's actually looking pretty, pretty darn good. Great. Baron, anything to add? Thanks. Uh, yes, I think the other aspect of this is, is when we extend and do tether in the lumbar spine, there's concern that we create kyphosis or the opposite of what is desired, which is sway or lordosis in the lumbar spine. But what we found is we're, we're actually doing a pretty good job of maintaining it. It's based on how we place the screw. So I think we can, we can get it right. And this, we're still studying some of these uh, factors. Yeah, uh, I would say that at least from our, some of our early animal experience, I would agree, I would agree with both of you guys on the, on the clinical side. Uh, some of the animal research we demonstrated almost a, uh, about a third as much sagittal plane correction as coronal plane correction. Uh, and we just haven't seen that to be the case clinically. I don't know if it's just the differences in screw trajectory and where they are, but um, uh, we've, we've had, I guess I would say less sagittal impact than I would have hoped for in the thoracic spine, to be quite honest with you. It's nice that it doesn't affect the lumbar too much, but uh, uh, I would have liked more in the thoracic than we're getting right now. Well, perfect. Um, Amr, I think uh, we're right on schedule, so uh, I'll let you uh, get into presentation mode on your talk and uh, take it away. The ideal patient selection, ideal growth modulation. Excellent. Just uh, phenomenal talks and a big thank you, Sophie, for sharing your story. I mean, truly inspirational, the Chiari and then the Fusion, I mean, you've done uh, remarkably well, and uh, it's wonderful to see that you're going to be joining uh, healthcare as well. So, my charge today is to talk about the ideal patient selection for the ideal growth modulation. I'm going to start actually with the latter and just, uh, you know, uh, cover what is growth modulation, because I suspect that there may be some of us on our uh, Zoom that may need, uh, you know, better understanding of this. And when we think about growth modulation, it's essentially a progressive change in the spine vertebra, perhaps the disc, that leads to this improvement in Cobb angle as a child grows. And the principle behind this is termed the huter volkmann principle, where compression on the convexity of the curvature will inhibit growth. And as you can see in, in uh, tethering, you know, we're approaching the patients from the convexity, we're, we're placing screws, compressing across those vertebrae, 
with the hopes that that's going to limit growth, allow the other side to catch up. And in an ideal setting, you'll see progressive uh, correction. And uh, Dr. Newton, who truly has been a pioneer in this, and this is actually a slide taken from, uh, from him, uh, really has shown us that growth modulation does occur. This is a three-dimensional uh, rendering. And what you're doing is you're looking actually at the spine from the front, okay? So just imagine looking straight forward. And what you'll notice is if you look at the vertebrae on the left, it's uh, not symmetrically formed, it's wedged. It's gonna be wedged on that concavity. The convexity is gonna be longer, but then over the span of uh, months and years, if uh, growth modulation proceeds like we want it to, you will see this gradual correction of the vertebrae with the hopes being that at that point, the spine has modulated and the tether is actually not necessary. One thing I would encourage all of you who are watching this is don't rely on single patient presentations. What you really want to do is you want to look at the data in numbers and preferably across several institutions. And Again, uh, credit to the HARM study group, which is the research arm of the Setting Scoliosis Strait Foundation for doing a ton of work in this space. So when the group uh, looked at 51 patients, 764 vertebrae, and did a ton of meticulous measurements of what those uh, disc uh, sizes were, what the vertebra sizes were from right to left, left front to back, and what was shown was that there is limitation of growth on convexity, both in the vertebral body and uh, in the uh, disc as well, and the vertebral and the spine overall. So, you know, again, you need to look at uh, large data sets, larger studies to really come to some, uh, some conclusions. All right. So, you know, what is ideal growth modulation? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a child who has a, uh, a pre-existing curvature, operate on the child, leave enough curvature, and then over time be left with a curvature that's unlikely to progress into adulthood. Of course, you know, if we're able to get it under 30, 35 degrees, that would be ideal because our natural uh, st history studies would show that those curves are unlikely to progress into adulthood. But much more important than that is that we want to make sure there's a balanced spine. And if it was just so easy, because it ends up being this really this balancing act, trying to get the spine to correct enough, but not let it correct too much, as you see in this child here. So as surgeons, we're trying to balance remaining growth, curve size, and intraoperatively trying to leave enough curve, but not too much of a curve that we're left with a nice balanced spine. And a point I really want to bring home is smaller curves are not always the best. So for example, if you take a look at these two curves, the curve on the left is a lumbar curvature that may measure around 18 degrees. The curvature on the right is a thoracic curve that measures closer to 28 degrees. I can tell you when you look at these patients, the patient that has the balanced curve is going to look, uh, is going to look much more balanced than a child that may have a smaller curve. So again, just uh, some piece of advice. It's not the magnitude of the curve. It's how our children look on the outside and are in balance. So who are our ideal patients? So we spoke about growth modulation. When we think of the ideal patient, we want there to be growth. And we can define this, you know, we look at patient age, that's, a, that's one factor. We look at the wrist or sign, which is a growth plate uh, on the hip. And then we look at the hand as well. And that's what most of us are relying more and more on. There is a biomarker that may be coming on the horizon that can make it more accurate. The second piece that we look at is how big is the curvature? The curvature, the FDA indications are up to about 65 degrees, but it's much more the flexibility than the magnitude of the curvature. When we think of not an ideal patient, an, an ideal patient, it may be easier to talk a little bit about who's not ideal. You know, in my opinion, if there isn't significant growth, however we define that, you know, you're unlikely to have a, have a good result, as you can see in this patient. So older patients, not enough growth, whether by Sanders or Risser sign, the curve is just too big and too stiff. Those patients are not going to be ideal. And of course, location of the curvature. Patients that may have curvatures that are in the upper part of their spine may not do as well as patients that have curvatures in the main thoracic or in the lumbar region. There's likely, you know, we're talking a lot about growth and remaining growth, but we have to be careful because if there's too much growth, and Baron touched on this earlier, 
that may make the curvature be less predictable as well. Dr. Newton has shown this in his uh, article in 2018, 16 out of 17 patients with open triradiates had a 50% revision surgery. Dr. Alanay subsequently followed up by looking at hand score. Again, too much growth led to a lot more reoperation. So there's likely going to be this sweet spot. You know, a patient that may have open triradiates, it's nine or 10 years old, may not be ideal. Patient that's a little bit older, whether it's a Sanders three, perhaps a four, may be better suited uh, for correction. When we think about, uh, you know, the ideal patient, we also have to take a step back and think about potential advantages. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, there's degenerative disease later in life. We're studying this. Dr. Lahner showed some data. It's most likely an issue as we fuse lower into the lumbar spine. The second big uh, piece is we're trying to preserve motion. We know even with a tether, there's going to be some loss of motion, but it's likely much less than if it's with a, a stiff rod and particularly less if it's in the lumbar spine versus the thoracic spine. So if I was to summarize, I mean, there's really two main things we're looking at. Is there enough growth, but not too much growth? Probably a Sanders three, but we have to take into account how big a curve we're treating. And then curve magnitude. If the curve is too large and too stiff, it's not going to be amenable to tethering. And then with respect to location, in my opinion, the ideal patient is the patient that would have the most benefit, and that's a patient with a curvature in the lumbar spine. And I'll stop it there, Peter. Hey, th thank you so much, Dr. Simdani. Great talk. And it's, a, you know, obviously information that continues to evolve as we continue to look at our research. We have a a, uh, a question in the uh, queue here, and it is, uh, does that mean that balanced curves have less chance of progressing? Yeah, so balanced curves for sure are going to physically and visibly look better because you're going to be left, uh, you know, uh, with balanced shoulders, the head over the hips, and the hips not shifting over to the to the side. With respect to continued progression, it's more going to be a function of what that residual curvature is. Whether that curvature is 30 or 35 degrees, it's unclear, but uh, we want to make sure uh, it's certainly much better for a patient to have a larger curve than to a curve that may be only 10 or 15 degrees, but shows a, uh, a imbalance in the way that patient looks. Thank you so much. Um... We'll move on now to our next patient speaker. Um, that's Sydney Borchardt. She joins us from uh, Oklahoma, and she underwent uh, vertebral body tethering too. There we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney. I'm a senior at Sophomore High School in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, this is just a little bit about me. I was diagnosed with scoliosis at age 10 with an 18 degree curve thoracic curve. Um, my doctor told me to wait six months and we would see um, how I was holding up. Um, and six months later, it progressed to 33 degrees. And so I was prescribed a Boston brace. Um, I wasn't really sure what the brace was. I was kind of confused since I was so young, but I'm a very type A person. So I just went along with it and I trusted my doctors. Um, so I wore the Boston back brace for 23 hours a day for two and a half years along with yoga and doing specialized exercises that I learned in Wisconsin, um, basically doing anything to prevent surgery. And um, unfortunately my curve had progressed to 43 degrees. And so my doctor told me that next time he saw me, he would be talking spinal fusion. Um, and so um, after I found out that I was gonna have to have spinal fusion, um, we wanted to look at other options just to be sure what was out there. And so kind of like Dr. Lee's son, Jacob, um, my mom posted my story on a VBT Facebook group and we got a lot of good recommendations. Um, one local Oklahoman told us about Shriners in Philadelphia. So two months later, we flew to Shriners and we visited with Dr. Wong to discuss VBT. And he told me that I was a perfect candidate and so we came back home um, trying to decide through our options of what we wanted to do. And we decided very quickly that we wanted to do VT and we trusted our doctors in Shriners, Philadelphia. So two months later, I had my surgery with Dr. Juan and his staff at Shriners, Philadelphia. This is a picture of my spine before surgery. And then right after is the second photo. And then this is how I am right now. And um, this picture of me with these um, Higgy Bears, we do this um, here local in Oklahoma. We donate them to kids at the Shri or at um, OU Children's Hospital. They're just 
little back braces on bears just to make kids feel more welcome when they um, find out that they have scoliosis so they for, feel more comfortable with themselves and um, knowing that they have something like them. And then this is me and Dr. Wong, um, my recent appointment in June. Ooh. There we go. And um, just to talk about how it has changed my life, both physically and mentally, like I said, I was nervous about the surgery, about VBT, because it wasn't FDA approved, but um, I was also excited to not have to worry about scoliosis and to stop wearing a back brace and doing these hard exercises. Um, after 10 days of my surgery, I was feeling good. I um, was physically feeling so much better. I started doing homework and playing my instrument three weeks after surgery. Um, I also got a corgi, which is really exciting. My kind of push through um, my surgery, that was exciting. Um, and I was back to school full time after six weeks. I was even ready to go back before then, but my mom was like, no, you need to stay home. <laughs> um, but it was really nice to feel ready to go in such a short time. And soon after my surgery, I started running two support groups called Curvy Girls, which is a, a nationwide organization that supports girls with scoliosis. I ran a chapter here in Oklahoma City and then one in Tulsa just to get the word out about VBT and awareness. I, um, like I said, I uh, started the Hagee Bear program at UU Children's just to make kids feel more welcomed when they find out they have scoliosis. And then the coolest thing I think is I was the 2021 2022 National Patient Ambassador for Shriners Children, where I traveled the country and spoke about my story and my medical journey, just trying to get the word about VBT. And as of right now, I plan on attending Oklahoma State University and studying occupational therapy. Um, as you can see here, these are a few photos of me and my friends from the National Patient Ambassador Program. This is me and Seth, and this is Connor and Mia. They were the uh, COVID year, so they kind of tagged along with us, which was really fun. And here's me playing my instruments. Um, VBT has really helped me gone back to my normal routines in such a quick notice. And I have never been happier and never been healthier. What a great story, Sydney. Thank you for uh, sharing. It's uh, wonderful to, to listen to both of you uh, young women uh, tackle the challenges of of scoliosis that you faced and uh, you're both just doing uh, amazing, amazingly well. So thank you uh, for doing that. I know that um, uh, there have been people commenting in the chat uh, about both of you and, and what a fabulous job you, you've done in uh, your recovery and also in your advocacy for helping other kids who are, who are going through this together as well. I, uh, I think that's just uh, really uh, commendable, remarkable, and uh, we're super proud of uh, both of you and, and and what you've been able to do after your surgery to to change the world and, and the rest of the patient's uh, experiences down the road. So way to go. Congrats. Um, there was one question in the chat on uh, how do we uh, uh, assess flexibility uh, in VBT and uh, Dr. Samdani, you mentioned uh, the indications. Can, could you maybe just expand on that a little bit? Sure, Peter. So uh, with respect to flexibility, you know, uh, we do it. There's a couple of different uh, realms that I think about. First is trying to determine how flexible the curvature is. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, certainly, I'd say the clinical examination is probably the most important, laying the patient down, having them twist in clinic. We also look at a variety of different x-rays. Uh, some people look, you know, have uh, patients in traction x-rays or bending x-rays. With respect to motion, I think, Peter, the question may be getting at that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we actually put our patients through an objective motion analysis laboratory, uh, all of our fusion patients and our VBT patients, both before surgery, then at six months after surgery, and currently to two years after surgery, although we're going to bring them back for five years as well, to get an objective, objective understanding of how their spine is moving through our motion analysis laboratory. Yeah, great point. I, I think I missed the, the point of the question. You're probably absolutely correct. Uh, Michelle uh, was mentioned earlier uh, with regards to her research uh, on uh, flexibility by Dr. Mianji. And uh, Michelle's been uh, coordinating for the Setting Scoliosis and Strength Foundation a radiographic assessment of motion, both on side bending and forward bending. Uh, Michelle, do you want to uh, answer that? 
Yeah, and I answered that in the chat too. There's a, a publication from 2012 where we described that uh, radiographic assessment, uh, looking at the individual vertebral segments of the spine and how they move um, in forward bending and side bending. Thanks, Peter. You bet. But I think the other uh, point, I guess, to make is that some of the differences in, in spinal motion may not be as uh, absolutely dramatic as, as one might guess. Uh, I think we we think that tethering preserves all motion. It, it preserves some motion for sure. Um, and the difference in motion between uh, what, what patients expect when they bend forward and twist um, is, is present and measurable, um, but not not uh, so remarkable that, uh, that it's uh, widely obvious. So uh, some of that may come down to really look at, at how do those discs uh, below, as Dr. Lahner mentioned before, uh, with regards to long-term effects of maintaining some of that motion really have on, on how those discs behave 10, 20 years from now. And so uh, I think uh, both of them suggested that we need to continue to follow all of our patients and and that will certainly be the case. And, and I can promise you that uh, that setting scoliosis straight in the harm study group is uh, committed to that mission. And so we're going to, to continue to get that data and to be able to answer those questions. Great, I think uh, Harvey, if you could move us along to uh, our concluding slides. Um, listen, if you're interested in uh, supporting setting scoliosis straight, uh, you can visit our website. There's a, a vast amount of information to to search on scoliosis. Uh, and if you want, uh, you can text scoliosis to 41444 uh, to make a contribution to support this type of programming and, and the research that uh, this group is so committed to. Next. Good. Other ways that you might uh, support, uh, you may have heard of the Amazon Smile. Uh, you can uh, sign up uh, for Amazon Smi Smile and have Setting Scoliosis be Straight Foundation be your uh, uh, charity of choice, and a half a percent of uh, purchases uh, Amazon donates uh, to setting scoliosis straight. That's another great way to uh, support the research. Next. Great. We also would like to thank uh, those industry partners of ours. Uh, these are implant companies who make the devices that we use to uh, and to the x-ray machines to, to analyze what uh, you have going on. And uh, they've done a, uh, a lot to support this research through uh, our foundation as well. Next. If you're looking for more information, uh, Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation has a YouTube channel where you can uh, review uh, all sorts of videos and interviews, tips, uh, summaries of research publications and frequently asked questions. And you can also review past recorded webinars, and this one will be posted as well. So there was one question uh, earlier about whether or not uh, this can be reviewed later, and the answer is uh, absolutely yes, and uh, look for it on the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation YouTube channel. Next. We've got uh, upcoming events. Uh, five webinars will uh, be hosted in 2023, and these are really international events. They're worldwide. We, we go regionally. Uh, through uh, each of the continents and try to uh, capture stories from uh, local surgeons and, phys and uh, patients and physicians uh, throughout the world. So uh, check the website and, and there's more information there if you'd like to uh, join on, on another webinar uh, down the road. Next. Great. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll have a few survey questions that will appear after this webinar. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you're attending that you would stay on just to answer those quick questions that'll help us uh, with our future programming and make sure that we're uh, addressing your needs uh, with future evidence-based patient educational material that we strive so strongly to bring to you. I guess that uh, is it. Uh, thank you for attending everybody uh, and uh, have a great evening. Good morning, wherever you might be around the world. Great.